Hello and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope the service you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some ways to help you take your next step. Uh, we want to connect with you and we know that life is busy and that you may be watching this or maybe on Tuesday afternoon or Saturday morning or some other day throughout the week that isn't on a Sunday. That's the beauty of On Demand that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as a part of our church family and help you take your next step, whatever that might be. So let us know that you're here by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. No matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word that you will truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we want to invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy our service. Well, good morning. Would you guys just uh, bow your heads and join me in prayer as we just acknowledge the presence of the Lord this morning as we head into uh, worship. God, we're just so thankful to be able to gather in your house this morning together as one body of believers. Let's pray as we would just come with open hearts full of gratitude, Lord, for, for you. We pray this in your name. Amen. I will believe and I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of Jesus Cause I will believe more for greater things there's no power like the power So 
communion I'm just going to sing from uh, or read not sing <laughs> read from Psalms uh, 63 it's a psalm of David regarding a time when he was in the wilderness of Judah it reads this oh God you are my God I earnestly search for you my soul thirsts for you my whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water I've seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory your unfailing love is better than life itself. Oh, how I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. That's the attitude us believers should have. Crying out to Jesus, lifting our hands to him in worship, staying ready for his return, because we all know it's near. Let's just bow our heads and uh, just reflect. God, we're so thankful for you and what you're doing here. God, I just pray we just continue to look to you, cling to you, You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of, of everything, Lord. I just pray that you would just uh, continue to be with the service and move in a mighty and powerful way. Lord, have your way. So we head into communion, Lord. I pray that we would just remember the sacrifice that you gave us on that cross as we take the bread and the cup, Lord, in remembrance of you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen.
snowball you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me From the beginning, the church was never about a place that you go. It's always been about the people. Our church is just a tool. And without you, our church is just a building. Here at Victory, we strive to create relevant environments where faith meets life. where people's needs are met in the moments that they need them the most. Where people find hope. Where the next generation can grow and thrive in their faith. Where the hurting find refuge. Where the lost are found. where real life change is happening every single week. Together, we are fueling the mission and vision of connecting people back to God. We don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. I got the recipe, never gonna let any up be the best of me. Thought it was distance, but haters is next to me. Talk to the spirit, you know I've been heavenly. Company definitely show your trajectory. This ain't a diss, cause I say it respectfully. It's time to eat up, red like a speeder. Taking it deeper, and that's how it better be. I never let the comparison get to me. I just remember the promises meant for me. I know the enemy and that he's in for me. I keep the blood of the lemons, my centerpiece. I cannot trust in no crystals or energy. Look at the chemistry, it do not even mix chemically. Most of the tricks, they be gimmicks, they mimic the truth. It's poison, and we got the remedy. Eat it. Hey y'all, I need you to know I did not come up with that song. That was somebody else that came up with that song, but I thought it was pretty cool. I love the song, got me dancing this morning, fired up and ready to go. Hey man, so I have another confession to make. Um, you know, I just got to be honest with y'all. Can, can I be honest and real up in here? I'm not the best parent in the world. I mean, if you don't know, I have three beautiful 
children. My youngest daughter, she's my only biological daughter. And I'll never forget the experience of having watched my wife give birth to her. I mean, all kinds of emotions were flowing through me, like love and joy, excitement. There was even a healthy ounce of fear. Like, yo, this is a whole baby right here. I just got to keep her safe, make sure she doesn't fall out of my arms. Like, you know, whatever you do, don't drop her, right? So I had this deep sense of responsibility. Like, you know, wow, so delicate, so innocent, and so loud. Man, my baby had a set of lungs on her. Well, anyway, one day, you know, she was really young, and I thought it was a good idea to give her an Oreo, you know. And oh my gosh, when I gave it to her, she didn't even know what to do with it. She, she, she held it. She looked at it. And then she looked at it some more, and then she did just like every other baby in the world would do. She put it in her mouth, and she began to chew on it. And, you know, you should have seen the look on her face. She had a moment. She was like, this is really happening right now. And so she absolutely devoured the thing. She was like a little cookie monster, y'all. And when she was all done with it, this was the end result right here. (laughs) She was a beautiful mess. She made an absolute mess. And, you know, um, you know she, she, she took this picture. If you take a look at this picture right here, you notice she's like, hello, can I get some more? Excuse me, more please. And, you know, so like a bad parent, I gave her some more. And, you know, she, she made more of a mess. And to this day, she wants more. So I try to limit her Oreo intake. And she's like, but dad, please. Can I get one more? And so, and you know what's interesting about her? She doesn't like just the regular Oreos these days. She wants the double stuffed Oreos, y'all. That's my baby. And so if you're here for the first time, you came on a great day because today we're doing a standalone message titled Chasing Oreos. I mean, Chasing Carrots, the endless pursuit of more, the endless pursuit of for more. Uh, Before I get into this message, I want to give a special shout out to all of my family and friends out in the Victory Indy campus. Can we give it up for the Victory family in Indy? Come on, somebody. And to all of you who are tuning in online right now, I want to say thank you for joining us. We're so grateful that you're a part. We love you. We're grateful that you're a part of the family. So when I was growing up, uh, this idea of chasing carrots looked a little bit more like this right here. And, And it served as a metaphor, right, that communicated the idea that the best way to motivate a donkey to, you know, move is to dangle a carrot right in front of it, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, when you have it right in front of the donkey, he smells it, he's looking longing to taste it, and so in a chase after the carrot, in hopes of eventually reaching and eating the carrot. Does that make sense? And I love this metaphor because carrots, they come in all shapes and forms. Some carrots look like this right here. Anybody in here chasing after money? I don't know. Uh, Some carrots might look like this. Anybody seeking after approval? Others, they look like this. Comfort. Anybody long for some just a comfortable setting and hanging out on the beach, putting your toes in the sand? Come on, somebody. I mean, you know what? One really big, really big thing in our society is this idea of fame. You know, and I'll tell you what, we could preach a sermon about each of these, but today we're going to narrow our focus onto the pursuit of fame. And I think the carrot of fame is more relevant at this moment in history than ever before in the history of the world. Just a quick glance at any one of your social media platforms, you know, you'll see that generally speaking, people want to be known. They want to be admired. They want to be liked. I mean, who doesn't want to be liked? Some people want to be followed, some people want to be accepted, some people want to be respected, and many, many, many people, they want to be famous. And I know some of y'all are in the house today, and you're thinking, that's definitely not me. I'm not chasing after fame. I'm not the one here pursuing fame. I feel you, but you need to know that you might be actually surprised that we are all chasing some degree of fame today. 
Okay, I'll give it to you. Maybe you're not like on a full-blown pursuit of fame, I, you know, but, but, you know, I believe many of us have little micro cravings for fame. You want to be known. You want to be loved. You want to be accepted. And, and if you look closely, you might find it showing up in very small, maybe little different ways in your life. For instance, if maybe you, you, when you overcommit, you end up doing way more than you like to because you don't want to let anybody down. I mean, so, so you have this deep need to be liked by everyone. So because of the micro craving for fame, you end up saying yes to things you rather say no to and you find yourself way too overcommitted. Maybe for you, it's a little different. It's, it's when you're seeking credit for something that you've done. Like, you know, I did that job at work. I want everybody to know that I did the job. That's right. I gave. I came up out of my pockets. I gave. I gave sacrificially, you know, and I want them to know that I gave. Maybe I served, and I want them to know that I served. And, you know, I'm showing up to do something special. I want them to know that I did it. I want credit for what I did. Micro cravings for fame. For some of you, it might be just a little bit different. Maybe for some of you, you, you are overly sensitive to any kind of criticism. You, you don't want any kind of rejection. A thousand people could tell you that you did a great job, phenomenal, outstanding. But as soon as that one person tells you that you were not all that and a bag of chips, you start to fall apart. I mean, one person could write a slick comment on Facebook and you like, oh, they don't know me. You get all bent out of shape. Like I'm deleting that comment. Right? Micro craving for fame. I want everybody to like me. I want everybody to accept me. I'm telling you, social media is like a breeding ground for the hunger for fame. Did you like my picture? I had to get that caption just right. Some people, you know that some people today, they will delete a photo within five minutes and if it doesn't get enough attention. It's crazy. It's like we're living for the like button. It's like we're longing for the love emoji. Micro cravings of fame. And for those of you who are here and you maybe you're above all of this, you're not hungry to be liked or known, you know, admired, respected, followed, or famous. You should know that chances are that your children, maybe even your grandchildren, they struggle with this. In fact, look around you right now. I guarantee you there's people around you right now that struggle with this. In fact, you want to know what research says about young people ages 10 to 12? They're 10 to 12 years old. It says, when, you know, when, when studying about these young people, you want to know what their top goal is? The number one goal, the top desire in their life is not for financial security, is not to be rich, is not, you know, for success or achievement, you know, you know community, great relationships. You want to know what the top, one top most common goal for 12, 10 to 12 year olds is? to be famous, to be broadly known, to be accepted, to be respected, to be famous. Now, just to be really, really clear, there is nothing wrong with being famous. It's not like a bad thing to be famous. It's not like a sin to be famous and nothing like that. In fact, if you excel in whatever you do, if you are the best of the best at what you do, if you are the brightest of the bright, incredibly talented, if you rise to the top of your field, fame is almost inevitable. In fact, you can make an argument that there are times in the Bible that God actually makes people famous. In the Old Testament, David, he's a great example of this. In 1 Chronicles chapter 14, when David was obedient to God, the Bible says that he made, well, rather it's God, he made him famous. And the, this is what the scripture says. So David did as God commanded him. You know, so David, he was faithful and he was obedient and his army, they struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. So what happened when David did as God had commanded him? It says, so David's fame spread throughout every land and the Lord made all of the nations to fear him. Evidently, God made David famous. 
God also made Solomon famous. In fact, if you don't know his story, God offered Solomon a request, kind of like a genie. You know, he says, you got one wish to make. What's it going to be? I'll give you anything that you want. And Solomon says, you know what I want? I want wisdom. And God's like, whoa, oh, since you asked for wisdom and not for riches and fame, I'm not only going to give you wisdom, but I'm also going to give you riches and fame. God gave fame. There's nothing wrong with being famous. In fact, Jesus is arguably the most famous person ever. I mean, history records that Jesus was amazing. I mean, he raised dead people back to life. He opened blind eyes. He healed deaf ears. Crowds followed him. He was famous. In fact, he still is famous. There is nothing wrong with being famous. In fact, you might not know this, but I'm kind of a big deal myself. I mean, I am. Not for preaching or anything like that, but I had a touch of fame in my past. My first touch of fame, probably my only ever, uh, was through an app called TikTok. You know what that is? Anybody know what that is? One day, I uploaded a video, right, and it ended up getting 148,000 likes within days. It was a short period of time, and we got, like, you know, love emojis, like crazy, you know, and and I showed it to my sister-in-law, and she's like, sick, you got TikTok famous, and I didn't even know what she meant by that, but, you know, it was what it was. I guess I was famous. Um, Let me ask you, you want to see the video? Let's show the video. When the night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see Come on, somebody. Don't I have a good voice? I mean, look at me. I promise you there's nothing wrong with being famous. But here's the thing, y'all. There's a difference between being famous and being in pursuit of fame. Listen, chasing after fame can be detrimental to your faith. It can be very, very, very dangerous to your faith. Pursuit of fame can be very dangerous to your faith because the trajectory takes your heart away from God. It takes it away from other people and it moves it toward yourself. And here's the thing. It's very difficult to be focused on others when so many others are focused on you. It moves the trajectory of your heart away from the things of God and from other people toward what I like to call the unholy trinity. Y'all know what that is? It is me, myself, and I. And what's fascinating about fame fame is that, you know, back in the days, you had to do something extraordinary to be famous, right? You had to do something very significant, something memorable. You had to be like the best in your field. You had to be an athlete, a movie star, famous politician, you know, an inventor. You had to land on the moon or something like that. I mean, something significant to be famous. And, And today, you know, we could be famous for being silly. You could become famous for being horrible at something. I mean, you could be famous for playing a little guitar on your sofa, upload the video, and that video goes viral. It goes viral. And that's what many people today are hoping for. They're they're hoping to go viral. That's what so many people dream about today, to go viral. And maybe this post, you say, will get hot. Maybe it'll blow up and I'll get that blue check mark. I'll be verified and now I could post my stuff and I could get paid because now I got a following. I, I, got, I got all these people that like me. I'm going to be known. This is what I need. Let me ask you a question. Are you chasing after carrots? It, 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 if only people will follow me more, if more people would like me. I don't know, maybe for you, maybe you're in the room and you don't even own a social media. I get that. Maybe for you, it's at your school or at your workplace or in your community. If I just have, you say to yourself, a little bit more popularity, if they knew me for my sport, you know, if they knew me for the craft that I have, if they knew who I was and what I do, you know, because I'm a big shot. 
If they knew me for being funny, I've got to ask, are you chasing carrots? Whatever it is, if they just like me, if they just approve of me, give me a little bit more acknowledgement. You may not say it out loud, y'all, that, that, you know, but you're saying that, that's what I'm missing in life. That's what I need to be happy. If this is you, I'm here to tell you that you are walking on dangerous grounds. Again, please hear me. There's nothing wrong with being famous. You can actually leverage your attention, you know, create, build a credible, legitimate following. You can make a real living from doing social media posts and make a real difference in this world. But be very careful because the pursuit of fame draws our hearts away from God, away from others, and it points it back to ourselves. And I promise you, counselors, they'll they'll tell you that fame can actually be traumatic. Fame, especially for a younger person, can be incredibly hard to deal with. It can even crush a young person, just small doses of fame. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe what the Bible has to say about it, you might believe what Jim Carrey has to say. He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they dreamed of so that they can see that it's not the answer. Fame is not the answer. Fame is not the answer, y'all. I mean, I, I think that we, what is the answer? I think that we can find the answer in Scripture. When I think about the Bible and I think about a person in history who handled fame really well, the person that comes to my mind is John the Baptist. Uh, If you don't know, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin or his cousin. You know, he was kind of like a crazy prophet. And, you know, he used to dress in the Louis Vuitton animal skins. And, you know, he ate locusts and honey and stuff like that. And, And he had, you know, he had a huge following. If he were living in our day, if John the Baptist had a Facebook, it'll probably look something like this. Look at his background image. You see that? You know what I'm saying? He got, oh, 3.3 million friends. This dude had a following. And if you scroll up his, you know, his little, his little profile, you'll notice he might say something like this. I'm here to prepare the way. Hashtag Messiah. I mean, you, you scroll a little bit more, you might come across this right here. Repent, bunch of snakes. Dang, look at how many comments, 4 million comments. I'd love to get into those comments and see what they have to say. You scroll a little bit more, you might, you know, you might come across this. He says, there's one that is coming after me. Hashtag Jesus, hashtag Messiah, hashtag King of Kings, hashtag Lord of Lords. That's what John would say. John the Baptist, he would say things like this right here, and you know, and he started to grow in popularity. He started experiencing micro doses of fame. They would ask him, Are you the one? Are you the chosen one? Are you the Messiah? And you know how he responded? Nah, bro. Don't ever confuse what I'm here to do. I'm pointing you to him. Do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? I'm here to point you to Jesus. Listen, y'all, I'm unworthy to even untie his sandals. So despite his following, despite the fame, this is how John responds to the fame. He must become greater and I must become less. I want to see more and more and more of him and less and less and less of me because it's never been about me. It's never been about my name being known. It's always been about him. And notice his heart's posture. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. Now, I've got to ask, when you look deep within and you think about your posts and your following, do do you share, honestly, the same heartbeat as John the Baptist? Do you share his posture? When you post, when you speak, when you enter into the room, do you have a heartbeat that screams less of me and more of him? I can honestly say that that's not always the case with me. Can I be real up in here? Not, not long ago, I was scrolling through my pictures, you know, and I came across this one picture. And I was like, okay, fly guy. 
I like this picture right here. And I literally seriously thought about posting the picture. And I got to thinking, thinking, you know, like, what kind of caption am I going to get that make this on this? Like, you know, how can I make this about Jesus? And truth be told, this picture had nothing to do with Jesus in the moment. It had everything to do with me. So you know what I did? I did not post it. Now, let's be real. Have you ever been there? Am I really the only one? Y'all need me to log into your Facebook right now and check out all them selfies? Come on, somebody. Keep it real. Have you ever been there? <laughs> where, the, where the thing is so much more about you than it is about Jesus? Here's something that I've learned over time. When you are at the center of everything you do, everything you do is often all about you. So as we look back at John the Baptist, he says, no, 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 no. My only mission in life is to see less of me and more of the one who came to save us. What would it be like if we shared this kind of posture, less of us and more of him. Can it even be done in a culture that celebrates fame, in a culture that creates this desire for 10 to 12 year olds to think that that's what I need in my life, more likes, more followers, more fame? How do I function in a culture that seems to be on an endless pursuit for fame? How can it be less about me and more about Jesus. Well, it boils down to one thing, motive. When you, when you get ready to post, what is your motive? When you show up to a thing looking like a hot chili pepper, what's your motive? Be honest. God can handle your honesty. What is your motive? Perhaps a better question to ask is this. Who are you representing? When you show up, when you post, when you talk, who are you representing? This is who Paul says that we should represent. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Okay, As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. Listen, y'all, who are you representing? If you are a follower of Christ, you are called an ambassador for Christ. And what is an ambassador? An ambassador is the highest ranking diplomat sent from one nation to another to represent the home turf or the home territory. And you, you know, you might be here today and you are a bona fide Jesus follower. You are, I need you to know that you are, if you follow Jesus with every fiber of your being, you are an ambassador for Christ. What are you? You are the highest ranking diplomat sent from heaven to earth to represent God. That's what you are. So I ask again, who are you representing? As an ambassador of Christ, when we walk in the room, you know what should walk in the room? Light should walk in the room. When we walk into the room as an ambassador of Christ, you know what should walk into the room? Hope should walk into the room. Listen, y'all, we're representing Christ by what we say, by how we act, by how we show love, by how we dress, by how we post. Whatever we do, let it bring glory to God. To God alone be the glory. Who are you representing? Who are you really representing? And I know it's Sunday and, you know, I know the right answer to every question in church is Jesus. But please keep it real. Are you really representing Jesus? Or are you representing the first member of the unholy trinity? Me. If you are honest and you look deep within, if that's you, I want to encourage you, let the Spirit of God do a cleansing work on your heart. Less of me and more of him. Be honest. Who are you representing? Let that question invade your heart. 
Let me drop another question for you. As you think about the life that you live, whose approval matters most? Whose approval matters most? Again, I know the right answer is always Jesus, right? But often, we're playing to the crowd, aren't we? We're laughing at jokes that we shouldn't be laughing at. We're trying to fit in, you know? We're not shining the light where we should be shining the light because we just don't want another person to not like us. And suddenly... Instead of living from the approval of God, we're living for the approval of the crowd. Why is it that so many people today crave being known, being noticed, being admired, respected, followed, popular, broadly liked? Well, psychologists tell us something interesting about this desire for fame. Psychologists tell us that the desire for fame, you know what it's rooted in? It's rooted in injury and neglect. In other words, you find yourself with a craving to be known, to be, you know, admired, noticed, admired, loved. You know, chances are that at some point in your life, you have felt insignificant. As a result, you find yourself on a quest chasing after significance. Psychologists will tell you that the chances are pretty high that you had parents that maybe set the bar, set the standard a little bit too high, and you found it very difficult to live up to their expectations, too difficult to please them. Or or maybe you were rejected by your friends at some point or felt overlooked. So there's this longing in your soul to be known and to be noticed. Constantly flowing through your head are questions like, do you like me? Do you recognize me? Do you validate me? Do you accept me? These are micro cravings for fame. Paul said this to the Thessalonians. He said, here is who we should be. You ready for this? For we we speak as messengers. We are messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. And what is the good news? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And look at what he goes on to say. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motive of the heart. Our purpose, check this out. It's to please God, not people. And notice, it's all about the motives. He alone examines the motives of the heart. So who are you representing? Whose approval matters most to you? Less of me and more of him. I'm telling you, less of me, more of him, less attention to me, more glory to him, less about my name, more about his name, less about follow me, more about follow him. And when everything in culture, you know, nowadays says be famous and be known and be like, I am choosing to recognize that that desire is rooted in some form of injury. It's actually rooted more deeply in sin. It's a false promise, and guess what? It does not deliver. We are called to something higher, y'all. We are called to something better, and I need you to get this. We are not called to be famous. We are called to be faithful, y'all. Faithful to the one who is faithful to us. And when you live a life worthy of the one who gave it all for you, You will stand before him one day in heaven. Let me tell you what Jesus will not say. He will not say, well done, my good and famous YouTube star. He will not say that. He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Somebody needs to hear this today. When you serve every single week, And not very many people even know your name. I need you to know that Jesus knows your name and he honors your service. You know, when, when you give, I mean, nobody really knows how much you give and you give so sacrificially. I need you to know that Jesus sees your sacrifice. He knows that you give the sacrifices that you make. 
He will honor you one day, y'all. And he will one day say to you, you gave a cup of cold water in my name. You fed the hungry in my name. You visited the sick in prison in my name. You did it. And you didn't get an applause, but I need you to know that all of the angels in heaven applauded the work. I noticed. I saw it. Your sacrifice mattered. And God, I'm telling you, y'all, he hears the cry of your heart. You're being faithful to the one who is faithful to you. He notices your Faithfulness. So tell yourself, tell yourself again and again and again. The world may not know my name, but I know a name that is above every name. His name is Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, my Savior, my Savior knows my name. And my name is written in his book. It's not about what you call me. It's all about what he calls me. He calls me loved. He calls me chosen. He calls me redeemed. He calls me more than a conqueror. Listen, y'all, he calls me blessed. And suddenly when I realize who he calls me and how he sees me, then... I'm not living for the applause of the crowd, but rather I'm living from the approval of God. His opinion matters. I want to serve him. Less of me, more of him. Less of me, more of him. David in the Old Testament, remember? David did what God commanded him to do and God made David famous. And I want you to check out David's heart's posture. Listen to his heart. He says this, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory because of your love and faithfulness. Never to us, never to us, not to us, but to your name, to your name, to your name, the name that is above every name, the name at which one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess his lordship to that name, the name of Jesus. Less of me and more of him. Can we pray? Father, I pray that you make this real in our lives, Lord. And God, we stand before you humbled by your goodness, by your grace, and by your faithfulness. And we offer you our heart. And we pray that you search it. And God, that you reveal to us areas in our life where we need to give it to you, to lay it at your feet, Lord God, so that it can truly be less about us and more about you. Lord, I pray that as we walk out of this place, Lord God, but never from your presence, that you would be glorified in every single thing that we do, Lord God, that it would be more about you, more about you, and less about us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe we all have a next step, and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that might be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up right now on your screen. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back to what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience has helped or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially because our vision is connecting people back to God. So go to victorycc.life.
Again, if you haven't experienced a live service at Victory, we invite you to visit victorycc.live for more information on when you can join us in person. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. See you next time.